could show Rita. Does that work? Looks to be. Okay. We're going to move to general requirements, Ryan. All right. Sorry about that, folks. So uh, as I just mentioned, non-public schools only receive equitable services. They never directly receive ESEA funding. These services are based on the needs of the students in the school, not based on the needs of the school. They must be secular and non-ideological. And it's important to note that they might be slightly different than the services being provided to their public school counterparts. But as long as they're based on the needs of the students in that school, they're going to meet ESEA requirements. And you're also going to need to make sure that anything that's done could be audited. It could be monitored by the federal government in the future. So we want to make sure we always have that documentation uh, ready to go just in case we need it. All right. So who is eligible for equitable services? How do we make sure we get those for our students? So first and foremost, you have to be a main DOE approved nonprofit, non-public school serving students at grades K through 12. So every year we get questions from folks and some folks, they're a for-profit school, they are not state approved, they have postgraduate students. Those are not included in the equitable services for ESEA funds. Every year, we ask you to complete a survey that gives us some basic demographic data, helps us understand how many students you have at your non-public school, because we're going to compare that to the number of students at the public district to determine how much ESEA funding those students are eligible for. Uh, you're also then going to participate in timely and meaningful com uh, consultation with your public school SAU. There are some required forms we have to do every year, and if you're doing Title I or Title III, that initial survey does have a bit more of a data request to determine eligibility for those students. Important to note, whether you choose to receive equitable services is a decision that's made by the leadership of the non-public school. All right, so you provided that student enrollment data to us in the spring, and we're gonna have a copy of that survey for you here at the end, just so it's nice and handy. You wanna make sure you're conducting a school needs assessment, just like our public SAUs are supposed to every year to determine your high areas of need. You go through the consultation process, you complete and sign a participation form so we know that you were consulted and that all of your concerns were heard. And then you work with your SAU partner to craft a project narrative, figure out where the funds need to be budgeted on that public application and establish some SMART goals for your work. Once again, these services are provided directly by the partnering public SAU. It could also be provided, though, by another public SAU or through an agreement with a private company. So oftentimes when we're talking about, say, Title II and professional development, the public SAU may pay a private ec uh, entity to come provide professional development to your private school teachers. Programs and activities funded through equitable services uh, can be provided on site at the non-public school or at a location within the public SAU. And again, all services must be to the benefit of the students enrolled in that school and not of the school itself. So shifting gears a little bit here and talking about the, the actual consultation process. Um, so one of the most important aspects of equitable services under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is the consultation process that takes place between um, our public school districts and their non-public school partners. Uh, and consultation is characterized by ongoing um, meetings or an ongoing process where uh, leaders from both organizations meet and discuss the needs of their respective students and also how those needs can be met through the use of federal funding. Overall, uh, the goal of this work is to essentially identify, plan, uh, and ultimately carry out programs and services uh, that will uh, serve to meet those identified needs of students enrolled uh, in our non-public schools. Now the consultation process itself uh, includes covering many important topics um, and should essentially be a candid conversation around the needs um, of students that have resulted from um, some sort of formal needs assessment process. Now following the identification of the highest areas of needs for students who are enrolled in a non-public school, uh, there should also be conversation around the allowable uses of various ESEA funds and how equitable services can be provided to help meet the needs that have been identified for those non-public school students. 
uh, once student needs have been identified and uh, there's basically been some level of agreement as to what equitable services will be provided, there then needs to be conversation around what sort of performance metrics, goals, et cetera, will be established for the resulting work um, so that the equitable services that are provided can be effectively evaluated and monitored for effectiveness over time. So as we've mentioned earlier, uh, consultation around equitable services should be an ongoing process. Uh, consultation is not meant to be something that occurs you know, once a year at the time of applying for ESCA funds. It really is intended to be uh, a fluid ongoing process that occurs throughout the year. Uh, as such, it's best practice to hold regular check-in meetings between uh, the public school district and their non-public school partners uh, to ensure that the programs and activities being provided as part of equitable services uh, are on track and are being effective. Now, as part of this process, uh, we also recommend establishing protocols around uh, the collection, sharing, reporting, et cetera, um, of required program data throughout the year uh, so that essentially when it comes time to report out on the programs and activities that have been funded through equitable services, that data is already readily available um, and can be reported to the state. So in speaking of consultation, there are some important milestones that you'll want to be cognizant of throughout the year. Uh, the first of these occurs in March when non-public school officials must complete the Equitable Services Participation Survey that Ryan mentioned earlier um, and submit that to the main DOE in order for us to be able to determine the eligibility um, of the non-public school for uh, equitable services under the ESEA. Beginning in April and continuing through July, uh, formal consultation meetings between both the public SAU and their non-public school partners should be occurring. Um, you know, it's important to discuss things and make decisions um, during that time frame, so that when it ultimately comes time to uh, develop the ESEA application for the coming year, there's kind of a firm understanding of uh, project narratives, budgets, related goals, um, and things like that associated with the equitable services work that's to be funded through ESEA programs. July is also the time of year when uh, non-public school officials must complete, sign, and submit, not to the main DOE, um, but to their public school partners, uh, what's known as an equitable services participation form. Uh, this, is, this form essentially is a, a formal acknowledgement of which ESEA programs the non-public school wishes to participate in for the coming school year. Uh, it's important to ensure that this form and the related work um, for the non-public school's portion of the consolidated ESE application um, are completed during this time frame, uh, so that everything is basically ready to submit when the ESE application becomes due on August 1st each year. Now, October is another important uh, point in the year to be cognizant of, um, and that's specific to the reporting out on program activities um, that have been carried out through equitable services. Uh, this would include things like reporting out on um, the number of students that may have been served through Title I funds or the extent to which professional development has been effective for staff at the, um, the non-public school. But it's basically the point in time where we want to make sure that any data we have related to um, equitable services is being shared with the public school counterparts um, because they'll need that information in order to complete um, some performance reporting for ESEA funds. Um, one thing I do want to make note of here is that um, when we look at this in terms of a, a, an actual timeline, uh, the October dates here or the October timeframes here would be for uh, the following year. So um, if we're looking at July as the start of that reporting period, the October dates here would be for the, the following October. So it would be a 15-month time period that we're reporting out on. Great, now we're gonna take a look at some of those forms. The first one we're gonna look at is the non-public consultation form. We wanted to note a couple features on them that are, are new or trouble points. So this 
feature that is being pointed to is a new additional checkbox we've added right under the non-public official's name, title, email, contact information. There is a section that says the official has watched this training or attended this training. That will be a requirement this year in order to receive the funds. And the training will be hyperlinked after it's done. Here on the, in the second box, this section is talking about agreeing on equitable services. Um, so if you agree with the consultation process, everything went smoothly, go ahead and select yes. You can select NA if not applicable. And if you select no, that means there's been some type of disagreement and we will need to see more documentation, um, per perhaps contact with the state oms ombudsman, which we'll be talking about later. I also want to note the signature. It can't be a just font, like a cursive font. It has to be an actual physical signature. So for Title I Part D, this funding source affects three public SAUs. It's for neglected and delinquent youth, and there's very specific qualifications for that. We're gonna have a separate consultation form for those, those folks. We'll be contacting you and hosting an additional training. So um, you will still have that form and stay tuned for more information there. This is a form ESEA coordinators, the non-public carryover reconciliation form. This form um, they send after the 15 month mark for the grant during that October date that Travis was mentioning. The non-public will need to note how many funds were not spent in the initial grant period. That red bar is where the amounts will be placed. You'll wanna pay attention to the 930 dates on that form. The next arrow is a section that needs to be filled out. We often see this left blank, so make sure to be circling one of those options. In response to your the non-public's carryover amount, the non-public will need to indicate which option they're choosing, one, two, or three, for whether the non-public wants to continue to use the carryover, the non-public is returning the carryover to the SAU, or they both decide to return those funds to the federal government. In recent years, the Maine DOE has provided significant flexibility in approving the carryover of equitable services due to the pandemic, but the U.S. Department of Education has recently clarified when carryover for equitable services is allowed. So in those two boxes shown on the previous page, you'll notice that one of them talks about delayed con delayed um, services due to extended circumstances such as natural disasters, delayed consultation, inability to employ qualified personnel or procurement challenges. The other potential reason for carryover that could be approved is the cost of equitable services came in under budget and there was insufficient time to provide more services. In either case, there must be a need for equitable services above and beyond what is being provided in the new fiscal year's application, and carryover will not be approved unless there is significant reason for it. Sometimes we hear from either the non-public school or the public SAU that one of the parties is being unresponsive. If one of your partners becomes unresponsive, formal communication must be attempted at least three different times by three different methods, email, phone call, certified letter. The certified letters must clearly outline that the other party has two weeks to respond. Keep copies of all of that communication. It must be maintained for ESEA monitoring purposes and you'll need to either provide evidence of this refusal to participate in equitable services by the non-public school, or non if you're a non-public school, non-compliance with statutory requirements by the public school, which would be grounds for a complaint to the state ombudsman. Who we will now introduce.
or will introduce herself. Shelly. Good afternoon, folks. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Shelly Shasi Jadra. I serve today in the role of the State Ombudsman. You may be familiar with my name and my face for other roles that I have within the department, which is the Director of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. The State Ombudsman role was established in statute to help ensure that equitable services and other benefits for approved, eligible, non-public schools and staff were provided. The responsibilities of the Ombudsman is to oversee ESEA equitable services requirements, serve as a general resource regarding equitable services, provide technical assistance as needed, and engage with non-public school and SAU officials if issues arise. As Travis mentioned, it is critical to conduct consultation, but it is also equally as important and must be conducted prior to making any decisions. If there is a concern with services or a lack of services provided by the public school, SAU, excuse me, if there is a concern with services or a lack of services provided by the public SAU, the SAU must provide a written justification for the decision in which they've made to the non-public school. The non-public school does have the right to file a formal complaint if there is a disagreement about program planning, services, or the lack of consultation. Thank you. So we've gone over a bit of the general requirements of equitable services, um, along with really consultation best practices and a calendar of when forms need to be completed. And now we're actually going to go through what these ESCA equitable services programs are in the eligible titles. Um, just a reminder that if you start to have kind of formal questions that you would really like others to see and for us to answer, please use the Q&A. Um, and as a reminder, yes, this is recorded and will be um, administered as long as these slides at the end on our website. And we'll show you guys where to find it when we do. So I'm gonna move us into title one, uh, which is all part A specifically we're talking about today, um, which is about improving academic achievement, right? There are allowable uses of funds for non-publics. They can run a targeted assistance uh, academic program model. So it, we often just call that targeted assistance for Title I identified students and Title I staff. So you're about to hear me, you're about to hear a pattern um, that really when it comes to a non-public school, there must be a process for identifying Title I students with assessments, tracking their progress, uh, must be adjusting programming according to that progress and notifying families of services. Um, and again, this is Title I students that are identified and eligible and one big understanding to have around that is that these students that attend the non-public would attend a public school that's a title one school um, and so they would be they would reside in that title one school in their resident district um, so they would be eligible um, and again you can also pay for academic supplies to improve high need areas for those students the title one students that have been identified and are eligible for services family engagement activities and supplies as well for those said uh, students and their families, and then professional development for Title I staff. And similarly, as I go through unallowable, um, you'll see it's really providing services to non-Title I identified students who do not reside in a school that would otherwise be a Title I school. Um, it's using non-Title I certified staff to do the support or run these interventions. Um, and it's paying, you know, you can't pay for supplies, activities, or PD for staff that's not in the Title I program. So this is very much a targeted assistance program for non-publics with the Title I eligibility and identification requirements for students, and of course, certification requirements for staff. Title II. All right. Title II Part A's intent and purpose is actually similar in the sense that 
The goal is increasing student achievement, but with a focus on increasing teacher and principal quality. So most folks, when they think of Title IIA, likely think of professional development. And so our allowable use of funds for our non-public folks, it's supplemental programs and services to provide PD for teachers, principals, and other building-based school leaders that meets that statutory definition we have here of professional development. It's also allowable to pay for related expenses to PD. So if folks are traveling for PD, if they're getting stipends for work outside of their contract hours, supplies, materials, those things that are directly connected to professional development, that can be paid for again, as long as it's through the public SAU. All right, and so unallowable use of funds. Uh, so there are some use of funds here that for the public SAU are allowable for the non-public schools are not. So for example, staffing costs, such as paying for substitute teachers or class size reduction projects are things that the federal government has ruled as unallowable for our non-public partners. Recruitment and retention activities, again, fall under that meeting the needs of the school, not needs of the students, so those would be unallowable. A common unallowable use for both our public and non-public folks is curriculum writing. Early on when Title II came out under ESSA, there was some guidance put out that Title IIA could be used for curriculum writing by our friends at the federal government. And they have since clarified that that's actually not an allowable use under Title IIA. You can do PD about curriculum, but you can't do the actual process of writing curriculum or purchasing curricular materials. Uh, and lastly, any PD tied to the needs of the school based on ideological concepts, um, PD has to be secular. It has to be based on the needs of the students. Okay, sorry, I spaced out for a minute. Um, so Title III equitable services can be provided as long as the non-public has an established program for multilingual learners, um, then they could potentially be eligible for equitable services through Title III. Um, the program is for improvement and enhancing existing English language acquisition and content instructional programs. It must be supplemental to core programming. That is a big, um, a big deal. Targeted programs for students with limited or interrupted formal education, multilingual, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, multilingual language learners with disabilities or refugee students. Professional development. This would be for English as a second language, instructional coaching, specialized professional development regarding multilingual learners for ESL teachers, general education teachers, administrators, and other school officials, and educational consultants. Parent, family, and community engagement partnerships with community organizations to improve student outcomes and or supports to families, events to seek community input on general education and Title III programming, and training activities designed to assist parents and families to become active participants in the education of their children. And knowing the rules, some of the unallowable uses of funds um, core services for multilingual um, learners, including ESL endorsed teachers or ML coordinator salaries, uh, the use for intake and assessment of multilingual learners, and minimum core professional development necessary to provide an effective English language acquisition and content instruction program for MLs, and this, all this information can be found in the equitable services um, spending snapshot as well. And if you have any questions, please um, contact Daniel Weeks. All right, last but not least. So uh, Title IV, uh, Part A, otherwise known as the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant Program um, is the I guess newest of the, the reauthorized ESEA programs uh, and essentially serves as a multi-purpose block grant uh, that comes to states that allows um, 
schools and school organizations to invest uh, in various aspects of their education system. So as such, uh, the Title IV program has several different um, subcategories, content areas, whatever you might want to call them, uh, under which funds can be used. Uh, now, regardless of what content area we're talking about, um, Title IV funds are all predominantly used for either uh, direct support services for students or professional development opportunities for teachers or other school staff who work directly with students. So the first of these uh, content areas for Title IV Part A is known as uh, the well-rounded education content area, uh, which essentially refers to programs and activities that are academic in nature, uh, but that also go beyond core academic instruction in math, literacy, and science. Um, this might include programs or activities focused on things like um, history or civics, uh, music and the arts. Um, STEM's a, a good example of um, a way to kind of circumvent that core academic content piece if you're doing uh, programming that's interdisciplinary in nature. Um, any of those sorts of activities would fall under the auspices of uh, well-rounded education for the, the Title IV Part A program. So Title IV Part A also includes a content area that's focused more on the physical and mental health of students. Um, so it's known as the Safe and Healthy Students uh, content area. Um, again, can support either direct support services for students or professional development for teachers or other school staff who work directly with students. Um, and work here can range from things like school counseling and mentoring programs, um, all the way to uh, physical health and nutrition education. And the third and final content area for the Title IV Part A program focuses on uh, essentially technology integration in schools. Um, so this effective use of technology content area, um, again, supports programs and activities that um, serve to essentially enhance uh, the use of technology in schools to either um, better instruction, uh, instructional practices for students, or um, provide higher level of digital learning opportunities for, for students. Um, again, this can cover things like personalized learning programs, um, you know, especially in light of the pandemic, you know, remote and hybrid um, methodologies for instruction are also kind of included here. Um, and just again, just note that this is uh, a content area that's focused on uh, programs and services either directly for students or directly for those school staff who are working directly with students. So um, alongside the allowable uses of Title IV, we also have some things that are uh, prohibited in statute. Now, granted, this isn't an exhaustive list and there are other uh, unallowable costs we'll talk about in a little bit that are kind of all encompassing for all ESEA programs. Um, but as far as prohibited uses of Title IV AIM funds specifically, uh, they're largely around different types of um, medical services for students, staff, et cetera. Um, there's also some nuances around um, health and, and reproductive health education here that I won't go into in too great a detail. Um, but uh, the other thing to just be mindful of is when we're, we're thinking about Title IV and specifically that well-rounded education content area, um, we need to be all kind of sure here that we're not focusing our efforts on math, literacy, or science discreetly. Um, if you want to support those types of content areas, you would have to do through so in an interdisciplinary way. Okay, Title IV, uh, the Title IV Party Program is also a bit unique compared to some of the other ESEA programs in that it has specific spending requirements associated with each of the three content areas we just discussed. Um, if you're spending any funds at all under either the well-rounded education or safe and healthy student content areas, the funding spent must total at least 20% of the overall Title IV Part A grant award issued to the public school district. Um, the effective use of technology content area uh, does not have this, this minimum spending requirement. However, there is a special rule associated with it in statute. Um, that essentially limits the amount of funding that can be spent on what's known as technology infrastructure. This would be things like 
tablets, uh, other computer devices, software licenses, et cetera. Um, and that limit is no more than 15% of the total amount of funds budgeted under that content area. Um, the reason for this is that really the U.S. Department of Education wants um, funding under the Title IV program, again, focused on programs and services um, and not so much on equipment, devices, and other things of that nature. And just lastly, and kind of wrapping up the Title IV section here, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that these content area spending requirements can have implications on equitable services and particularly the participation um, in the Title IV program by a non-public school. Um, this is particularly uh, pertinent for folks who might have relatively small enrollment as compared to their public school counterpart, um, where their overall enrollment might equal less than 20% of the total uh, enrollment for the school district. So um, as we've shared previously, you know, ESEA funding can support different types of activities for both public school districts and non-public schools. However, that's not necessarily always the case when it comes to the Title IV program. Um, and again, that's because our services are based on um, basically prorated uh, percentages of enrollment from both institutions. Um, and again, there could be instances where, you know, a non-public school's enrollment amounts to less than 20% um, of the total enrollment for both entities in which case, um, if they're participating in the Title IV program, they may not necessarily be able to do um, work in a different content area relative to what their public school counterpart is. Um, so this is, again, kind of an important nuance to be aware of, be cognizant of, and um, discuss as part of that ongoing consultation process. Great, and we're gonna to move to fiscal oversight with Tyra. Okay, so um, the general cost requirements are as they are with any other federal grant, they need to be reasonable, necessary, allocable, allowable, and well-documented, as well as neutral. All costs must be secular and non-ideological in nature. These unallowable uses are across all ESEA funding for equitable services. At no time should a direct payment be made to the non-public school. The public SAU will um, purchase all services or um, supplies on behalf of the uh, non-public school. Base pay for administrative and central office staff is an unallowable use. Uh, the funds cannot be used for construction, renovation and remodeling, textbooks and general education materials for the school, advertising, public relations and fundraising. In addition to those unallowable uses, um, ESEA funding cannot be used to purchase gift cards or gift certificates. Um, food is not an allowable use unless instructional supplies for students. Alcoholic beverages, of course, non-educational trips, games, or other costs, and any costs that are non-secular and ideological in nature. Fiscal requirements. Service must be services must be supplemental and costs must be allowable, necessary, and reasonable. When we're talking about services that must be supplemental and in no case supplant the services that would in the absence of the services provided under this program be available to participating private school students. And you can find that regulation in 34 CFR 299.8. The, SA, the SEA, which is the state, reimburses the public SAU for equitable services after services have been delivered. We cannot prepay for any um, services. Any materials purchased remain the prop property of the public SAU and should be labeled accordingly. Okay. 
Okay. I think we had a question in the chat. I'm going to finish the section off and then we can um, answer any questions that have not been answered. I'm going to talk a bit about reporting and monitoring. Um, as part of a federal program and federal legislation, we are mandated to report to the federal government. For Title I Part A, for non-public specifically, that means demographic data of the students that are in the targeted program, grade level data. Um, we wanna make sure our number of students match. Um, and then of course the instructional services data. So how many of your non-public Title I students are receiving math, reading, maybe it's all math, all reading, um, but you'd be reporting on those programs through that. The public SAU does that as part of the performance report. Um, but they do ask for non-public school student data for those reasons. And then I'm going to talk a bit about monitoring. We are, of course, required to monitor for our federal programs here. ESEA and Equitable Services does have some touch points with monitoring. Um, we lovingly title them as letters and codes, but these do have full titles on the website that's there um, with the URL you can see, and we'll link some sites here at the end for you to have bookmarked. But essentially um, your public SAU will be submitting consultation evidence of emails back and forth for one of the items. Um, if you're using Title II funding for PD, your public SAU may, might be asking non-public um, the non-public to submit their professional development that aligns with the statutory definition, evidence around Title II things. Um, item E5 is a fiscal item, and it says just what it what it means. Basically, we're checking that payments are being made on behalf of and not directly to the non-public SAU. So that's a big one that we check for fiscal compliance. Um, and we do check that in item B, uh, B1, that there's a diverse stakeholder group conducting a needs assessment, much like public SAUs are required to do. And that's Title IV. Okay. So as we move forward, oh, Ryan, some surveys, please. <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have a couple of surveys we're going to link in the chat here in a moment for all of you folks. Uh, the first that you're probably most interested in if you are a non-public school is that Equitable Services Participation Survey that we do at this time of year every year. So that is completed by you at the non-public school. It indicates that you're interested in receiving equitable services. It provides us with what are your October 1 counts so that when we determine your percentage for equitable services, we're using kind of the same numbers we're using with our public school counterparts. If you're receiving Title I funds or if you're looking to receive Title I equitable services, I should say, there's also a separate form, a spreadsheet you fill out for those Title I-A funds, so we can determine exactly how much funding from the public SAU is gonna be set aside for those services. Um, and I believe that survey is due by the end of the month. Second survey we have, and this is for everyone here, whether you're in a public SAU or a private school, is much in the same way our public SAUs consult with their non-public school partners on equitable services. We at the state of Maine have some Title IIA and Title IIA funds that we spend as part of our state reservation, and we're required to consult with all of you to figure out what are the needs of the schools across the state of Maine. So we have a state activity survey that we're also launching this month, and we'll have that link in the chat for folks that we would appreciate if everyone could take a chance and fill out. That way we can know exactly what we should be spending our state reservation of Title II and IV on. All right, so for those who are with us now and those who are watching this recording in the future, uh, there's gonna be another link popped in chat that goes to our website and brings you to the resources page. If you're on that resources page, you'll see this uh, lovely set of pop-up images here right at the top, and one of them is Equitable Services. Under that Equitable Services link will be a number of resources that we wanted to share with folks. First and foremost, last year, the federal government released Title VIII non-regulatory guidance on equitable services that will likely answer many questions you might have as you're going through this process. In order to help folks with this process, we've also put out some sample email communications that our public school folks can use when reaching out to their non-public partners. We've also created a graphic organizer that really goes into depth on that consultation process and helps you understand what is the information you need to be discussing if you're a non-public school and if you're the public school partner in that process. 
We also have our consultation form, our reconciliation form, and the equitable services spending snapshot that was mentioned earlier. A copy of this slideshow, once we're done here, and the recording in the next few days will also be posted in that same place. As always, if any folks have any questions, they are welcome to reach out to us here on our website. On the ESEA team, every public SAU has a regional program manager tied to their superintendent region. Um, so they, most of you folks know who your folks are that you contact, but as a reminder, that's who you'd reach out to. Non-public schools should reach out through their public SAU with questions and then reach out to the ombudsman if there are any concerns. And lastly, the department wants us to remind all of you that you can connect with us through all of our social media platforms that you see here.